Welcome to This Sustainable Life, the premier community on learning to live sustainably. Are you trying to live sustainably? Me too. Enjoy the process? Me too. To hear heads of government, business, culture, sports, and everywhere also doing it, changing government and corporations. I've been on my journey of environmental sustainability for years. My guests and I have learned and share on sustainable food, sustainable farming, sustainable travel, and more. This podcast shares my results, often opinionated, and world-class guests I lead on how to be more sustainable. You're about to hear an episode originally recorded audio only. You'll hear the original podcast name, Leadership in the Environment, because I focus a lot on leadership. Subscribe, upvote, share, and tell everyone about it. We're growing fast. Now here's the episode. Fascinating. Yeah. That, that's what I study. That's what I do experiments with. When you said to me, you know, you're going to do an environmental experiment, my brain went, and I like had a split brain reaction. <laughs> One, one was, okay, if it's about the kind of environments that I'm studying and I love to, I'm game. You know, I'll push this envelope further in the world that I'm studying because that's what this year is about. 2018 is all about growth. Hi, this is Joshua Spodek, and this is Leadership in the Environment. You're not the only one who cares about your impact enough to act. You're part of a global community undeterred by people saying, if others don't change first, then what I do doesn't matter, and other excuses. We've read the science. We can do this. This show is about personal responsibility, acting, and improving your life by your values. As guest after guest says, the challenge was hard, but thank you for getting me to do it. I wish I'd done it earlier. Listen on for leaders to inspire you. Hear their struggles. And then act. Go to joshuaspodick.com slash podcast to commit to a public, personal challenge of your own. You're not alone, and you don't have to wait for others. Welcome to my first conversation with Judith Glazer. If you're interested in things like credentials, Judith co-founded the Harvard Coaching Institute, her own consulting and coaching firm, and she's worked with places like Apple and Burberry and Donna Karen, and not only worked with them, but she's met Donna, which she talks about in our conversation, and she works with CEOs at places like this. We met through a close personal mutual friend. So when she and I met, it was at her place in person. And I think that came out that I think you get to see the behind the scenes, the actual who is Judith. In the conversation, she talks about big breaks, about making mistakes during these breaks, but still rolling with them and making things happen. Now, I'm pretty nerdy and I look at the world in a pretty conventional way, more conventional than her. So we'll see a different side of the environment about science and nature. I would say she's almost countercultural, but you know, very friendly and approachable. So I can see how she gets these really big clients. But mainly it's a different approach to the environment, still meeting my criteria pretty enthusiastically. So without further ado, here's Judith. Welcome to the Leadership and the Environment podcast. This is Joshua Spodek. I'm here with Judith Glazer. How are you doing? I'm doing really terrific. Thanks so much, Josh. Can I yeah. call you Josh or Joshua? What do you prefer? I prefer, usually I go by Josh Spoken, Joshua mm -hmm. Written. Okay. And, but there are a fair number of people who call me Joshua. Okay. All and right. I think actually, when we saw each other in person last time, I think I asked you if it's Judy or Judith. I was born as a Judith, and then my parents decided that they wanted to call me Judy because Judy Garland was a very popular person at that point. And um, they saw me as being a talented little girl. I like to sing and dance. So I became Judy. And then I reclaimed Judith when I was working with Donna Karen. All the couture presidents said, if you're going to work with us, you need to become a Judith. That's a better name for Donna Karen couture. All right. Now, I was going to start asking you about what we were talking about a little bit before. And now uh -huh. I can't help but ask about Donna Karen. What is there a story behind you working with Donna Karen? Oh, yeah. So Donna Karen had gone to one of these weekend, you know, the places where people go to meet other people, but mostly to do all sorts of spiritual workouts, if you will. And uh, while she was there, she asked around and she said, our company is going through lots of changes and I am just not sure that we have it all figured out. And do you have anybody that does that kind of work? And one of the people there is someone that I was working with. And he said, I actually think I have somebody great because I know that she was going to be a designer when she was younger in life and then became a consultant now. But I think she'd be great for you to talk with. And so I was set up to meet with Donna Karen and she and her CEO at the time. And I talked and they both had the same reaction that I had the lingo. I had the right language. I understood design and that she thought I'd be great to work with. And I didn't know what that meant to work with. 
And so they said, well, why don't you come back and you'll meet the presidents and we'll let them decide if they want to work with you. And so I got all dressed up and I didn't study like I should have. You know, you have to do homework when you're meeting new people. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't study that everything was black in the company. Everybody wore black. They could wear white, they could wear black. Maybe they could wear gray, but maybe navy blue. But for the most part, black was the code for what we have to wear. And there was a reason. The reason is that designers need to have a black palette so that when they design, they don't get influenced by all people's clothes and that pull them in different directions. They have to use their intuition. Anyway, I went to this meeting and I opened up the door and in the room were 31 of her top executives. And I didn't know the code word black. And so I walked in and I wasn't wearing black. I had just bought clothes, but they were not black clothes. And they ended up hiring me. They overcame their bias and hired me. And then when I got into the company the next day, Donna said, take her to the closet. And they, I took, <laughs> <laughs> they took me to the closet and they stripped me down and they put on a black suit. And I had black shoes on that day. And they said, you can't wear them. And I said, why? They're black. And they said, no, they're Ferragamo. <laughs> so that was my uh, initiation into the Donna Karen pack, but um, they changed my name to Judith because they felt that like couture, which is the division that Donna was most favoriting, that they wanted me to be appropriately dressed and appropriately named. Okay. Now you told the story in a humble way and talking about the mistakes that you made and that you wore the wrong clothes and you wore the wrong shoes. On the other hand, 31 executives, presidents of the organization, a world famous, I presume at this time, her name is world famous. Mm -hmm. I presume at this point, you've come out of Harvard, you like, you got some credentials behind you. Mm -hmm. Was she the first big person at that level? Or was this company the first person at that level that you were working with? No. So you already had big breaks before. I had breaks before from the time I started in, I wrote a business dictionary, 1984 to 1986. And at the time, there was this senior consultant who lived, she lived in our community. And he met me and he said, I want to take you under my wings. And he said, I think you're great. And I want to get you started. So the first project I did with him, besides, I did the dictionary, but that, and that also came through him, but he put his name on it, but I actually pulled together 3,500 new business terms for Random House. So here I had taken on something that everybody said was impossible, impossible, and did it. So I had that as part of my um, self what's the word? Challenging, walking on coals in a way. Mm -hmm. And then when I worked with this guy, he was working with all the major accounting firms and they're big and they became bigger. And he introduced me to how to work with people that are analytical, smart as all get out, challenge everything you say, don't believe it. You know, how do you show up with that type of person? So he helped me with that. And he also asked me to write an article IBM had come to him and said, I want an article on whatever you want to write, whatever you think is important. And so he did a lot of, I guess that's what senior executives do or senior consultants do when they run out of things to do. They bring in talent and then they develop it. And that's what was happening to me. And so I wrote this article for IBM. It became the article of the year. It was um, navigational listening and it gave me a chance to find a place that in my heart I had songs going and I just needed a place to write it out like a palette. I had to paint it out. And I did. And it is the core of the work that I do today. So that's what started me. And I started to realize, I mean, to get the best article of the year, and that was 30 some years ago, and to have IBM ask me if they could republish it last year was incredible. So it had longevity. And so I had to learn, my humility in a way comes from just being me and learning that the universe is going to provide me with opportunities and I should take them look at them. And if I want to take them on, do it with 100% of my heart and my mind and my spirit. And I'm going to learn things about myself that I don't know. So I don't get stuck in, here I am, here's my brand. I'm so smart. Listen to me. That's not where I come from. I'm on this amazing journey. And every week, every month that I interact with people, they provoke me to think in new ways. And I learn to stay in that mode of growth that my mind needs. I want to live to be over 100. So you know, I have lots of years yet to go. (laughs) And if I stop growing and I become too arrogant about it, you know, regardless of whether I've worked with, you know, a hundred presidents of big companies or, or not, that's not the thing. I just want to be able to continue to learn with people. And that's the energy that creates success in the world. You make it sound so easy. (laughs) It is. That's what I say to the people I work with. (laughs) 
It is easy. I, you know, I believe in magic. Do you believe in magic? Do you mean like tricks or do you mean supernatural? So like supernatural magic, like things happen. Like you walk into a room, there's too many people there, there's not enough seats. And then you find the one seat that's empty. And then you turn to the person next to you and you just introduce yourself. And all of a sudden, five hours later, this is the client that you wanted to meet. And you're the consultant that they wanted to meet. You know, it's all right, if you're going to ask that way, I'm going to give you a story. And I hope okay. I'm not talking too much. No. Uh, but two weeks ago, a friend of mine who's a podcaster was giving a talk at the Science and Business Library in Midtown. And he invited me to go because this podcast, you know, I'm starting it. Mm-hmm. And he says, Josh, you might learn a thing or two. So I get there. Actually, I got confused. I thought it was on Fifth Avenue. It's on Lex. So I went to the wrong place. And, and then when I got there, they kept giving me directions. Like They were like, it's over there, pointing vaguely. So I, just, I had a hard time finding the room. I got to the room. There's a sign saying, it's full. You got to go to the spillover room. The spillover room is like this closet. I'm not going to sit in a closet and watch something mm-hmm. on TV with my friend. I can watch TV without being in a closet. So I go to the main room and this is what made me think of it. In the back of the room where, where the door is, there actually is an empty seat and some guy's stuff is on it. So I say, you know, do you mind if I sit here? And he's like, oh, I got to move my... I'm like, come on, man. You don't get two seats. Anyway, so I sit down and so my friend David is up at the front of the room. He's talking and the other panelist who's in the room is a guy that I had lunch with just before, who's I knew through David, but didn't know that well. On the screen behind them is projected a third panelist whose podcast I'd done that Monday, like mm. a couple days before. And I was like, how do I know? Did I, like, did one of them introduce me to the other? But I know them completely separately. And the sound keeps going down on the, the guy who's piped in on the internet. And so they have to call in a technician to get the sound working for him. While he's unable to be heard, he switches over to show his screen, which shows his web page, which shows me and my book. Yeah. And so I'm looking at my friend David talking, and behind him is Joshua Spodek, leadership step by step, become the person I'll just follow. I'm like, I took a picture of that. So I'm like, that's really cool. Then after David stops talking, the MC, the woman from the library who organized the whole thing, she starts talking and saying, we should all learn lessons from these people. For example, we should learn from Jeff, the guy who is on the screen, to become the person I'll just follow. All right, to have my name up there is pretty cool. But if you're going to talk about me, I'm going to join the conversation. So I stand up in the back of the room and say, sorry to interrupt, but, and like, okay, so the woman speaking now sees this guy in the back of the room stand up and like, she's probably thinking, who is this jerk? Mm -hmm. So she starts talking a little bit louder. So I have to talk a little bit louder. And I go, sorry to interrupt, but that's me. You're talking about my book. And she's like, what? And Jeff, who's, I guess, sound could hear this. Like he goes, is that Josh? So now it sounds, it's all credible. And she invites me up to the front of the room. And then she invites me to come to have an event. And I'd done an, an event at the library in my neighborhood. I know the head librarian because it's across the street from where I live. And he put me in touch with the central libraries and I never made it through to have an event. And now it's switched from me trying to get contact with the libraries to the, the libraries pitching me to do an event. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you want to call yes. that magic, that's what yeah. happened. <laughs> that's the magic I'm talking about that It's my belief that every human being was born to be on a journey in life. And as long as that journey goes, and our job as human beings is to appreciate and experience and understand that that's how the journey unfolds for us. And the more we start to follow somehow things that become our dreams and our aspirations, when we do that as opposed to expectations, expectations are where somebody says, I expect you to be a doctor, I expect you to be whatever, uh, an all A student. And those expectations breed a negative neurochemistry in the body. It's the fear hormone that gets activated, the fear of, can I live up to the expectations that somebody else has of me and do I want to? And instead, if we start to follow our aspirations, which you did when you wrote the book, which you did when it came to some picking out interviews, there are a lot of things in your life that you're going to see are pathways and gates and ways for you to experience who you are intended to be in the world. Your specific genetic code is one thing that you start off with, and then you get to explore it in the journey. And like Joseph Campbell, which he wrote books and books and books about their mythology books and their real books about the journeys that human beings go on. And you're in it. When you find those things happen, it's like the little pixie dust that you're following now. And somehow your gut tells you. The other side of the cortisol, which is the fear part, that the expectations when people judge you and expect you to do things, but it's what they want you to do now. You, your heart tells you to do. But when you get to the other side, then you experience oxytocin. The ability to bond with other human beings exponentially grows and you start to connect and find and feel 
where you need to go next. And that doesn't mean mindlessly. You're not just doing it like as a whim. There's a reason like you discovered or I discovered when I sat next to a person, the person in the room who led me to my biggest client. It's the way it works. If we go to that level, it's the way it works. All right. I want to ask about getting to that level because I have a feeling you're good at helping people do that. And it sounds like you've done it multiple times. And it Mm -hmm. looks like you can do it pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Before I do that, I want to ask about where you get to because you described this transition of getting to the other side and you described it as as amazing, as incredible. Can you be more specific? Like, is it, okay, you get oxytocin and you get like, what does it feel like? Is it gratitude? Is it um, reward? Is it satisfaction? Is it all of these things? What do you get on the other side? We don't know when we're born. Our parents don't know, although our parents try to influence who we will become as an adult. But in a way, we don't know. We are born with a certain genetic code, and that code can be epigenetic, which means that it it can be influenced by the environment. That's how human growth works. So we're given a certain set of DNA that are turned on and off. Everything is not set in place permanently. It's our human nature to discover who we will become. And we get influenced by parents. And and I want to share a story about the work I did in disruptive innovation and what I learned there to to be able to tell the kind of story I'm telling you now. Yeah, please. The story is that we are given this genetic code and by interacting with other human beings, by having these moments that turn on and off belief systems inside of us or hope inside of us, human beings are designed to achieve this aspiration. Whatever we were designed for, whatever our human nature is, our job in a way, maybe it's not a job, it's our beautiful opportunity is to learn how to recognize when we interact with things, the things that happen that feel magical are there for a reason. And to allow that to continue to happen because that's where we discover who we are as human beings. And it could take us in directions that we never, ever, ever anticipated. And that's okay. It's what I grew up and my parents said, you should be a teacher. And I said, I don't want to be a teacher. They said, well, if you ha- you'll have the summers off. I mean, they gave me all these reasons why I had to be a certain thing. I ran away from home. I didn't like that type of influence. That's, I was interested in anthropology and archaeology and science and literature and you know all these things that were just being invented, semantics and general semantics and linguistics and putting it all together. And they'd look at me like, uh, you're crazy. In fact, they even sent me to a psychiatrist because they couldn't understand my, what I was saying. And the psychiatrist said to me, crazy person, (laughs) he said, you sound like you're schizophrenic. And if you are, then I need to hospitalize you. But if you're not, yeah, yeah. But if you're not, don't talk like that again. And I went home and I divorced my parents even further. And I ended up meeting, and my father actually introduced me to the head of a program at Drexel. She was the, the chairman of this new department in human behavior and development. And my father said, you should interview my daughter. She talks like you talk, <laughs> which I thought was funny. And in 20 minutes, she said, I'm giving you a fellowship. And <laughs> she said, you're the person I've been looking for. And she loved my crazy talk because it's what she was studying, the epigenetics and energy fields and in, uh, differentiation and integration and generativity and all these, this language that I had been inventing to explain the world that I saw. And thank God I didn't take the other trade. The other trade was becoming a teacher and spending my summers with my kids and not growing this body of work. Or even being institutionalized. And being institutionalized. And I probably would have found a lot of other interesting people there. (laughs) So, Would you agree that a lot of people in the world could do what you've done, but feel inhibited or scared, or maybe they take the advice of others and say, all right, I guess I should go that narrow path. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know how many times I can say yes. (laughs) That was the best question. I want people to know and to hear and why I love the coaches that sign up for the program that I do from all, we have 75 countries represented. And I feel like I'm speaking to the, my soulmates, my dreamers, my cohorts that really believe that there's another way to look at human nature. And that a lot of the things that are out there is an, our old research that led us to where we are now. But the new research is much more interdisciplinary and it challenges old conventional ways of thinking. And so when we bring the epigenetics and and look at genes and talk about what do we learn about genes and that genes can get turned on and off now through conversation. And then if that's the case, what's the environment that a young baby in the womb, let's go to the womb first. And when David Haig said, oh my God, as a mother is interacting with her baby, which she does all the time, 
she can create an environment that feels good. She could sing to the baby. She could listen to the baby, find what the baby kicks to. Sometimes the baby may be hearing what you're saying or doing and kick as a result of it or get calm and peaceful. If there are two babies in the womb, they're talking to each other and turning on and off genes. One will be stronger out of that conversation. One will be bigger. One might be born sooner. Um, There are all sorts of things that happen that we're learning now that give us the platform for who we're going to become. And that changes everything. I'm really curious about something you said at the beginning of what you just said there, of the feeling that you get with the coaches you work with. Because Mm -hmm. the specifics that you work on, your particular passions are going to be the things that you, those are the things that you're doing and the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. People listening, they're not all going to be into exactly what you're into, but they're going to be into their thing, what turns them on, Mm -hmm. what their genetics resonate with. Right. Very right. How is that? What is it like when you're working with these people? Because this is the feeling that they're going to get, whether they're, they might be doing something that has nothing to do with what you do. Maybe they're going to become an actor or maybe they're going to become an astronaut or something like that. Aren't they going to feel, they're going to have people in their lives that mean to them what your people mean to you. And they're going to have work that means to them what it means to you. What is it like when you reach where you, how do you put it? What, where are you now? Is it that you found your calling, that you found what your DNA is right for? Is the you me or is the you you them? Um, when you say when you use the word you, how would you describe where you are? Like what tells you that you are where you should be, and then how would you describe that state if that, if that is the right? right. So if, so after I went through my personal journey with whether it was my te- professor who really helped me see that who I was becoming just to keep going and growing, and that I was on a path. She wanted me to write a book at the when I was twenty three years old. She wanted me to write a book with her. That's how important this work. She reframed it for me. So between her, between the consultant that brought me into, and then I got all of these things to happen to the big clients that I had where a CEO of a company like John Emery, Emery Worldwide, who launched big freight forwarding. I was his consultant. I worked with Clara. I was Steve Sadoff's consultant. I worked with Donna. You know, all of these people that believed in the work, Angela Arns from Burberry, moving over to Apple now. I mean, I had confirmation at a high level. So I became confident that I was going to trust my gut, that I had been integrating things interdisciplinarily and in a new way. And so when I ended up the first year having a thousand coaches sign up and the second year, 1,250 sign up, and in both cases, more people becoming certified. I remember going through things with the second group that scared me a little bit, but speak to exactly what you're saying. And that is Everybody had their own passion, but they, had, they saw something or felt something about my work. They picked up words that I was using that had them say, ooh, that's something I'm curious about, or that's what I wanted to know. That's my missing link, or I think I, this is going to integrate, you know, whatever it is that people say to themselves. The second year, we had incredibly judgmental coaches and challenging coaches because they did what you said. They had certain things in their mind that they hoped that they could learn more about and more of. And every time I would introduce something, they'd say, well, isn't that like such and such? Or, you know, that can't be true because of this that I learned. So I was weeding through with them knowledge that they had collected through all of the years, 5, 10, 20, some cases, 30 years of learning. And here I was introducing something that was different, some the same words, but different. And so they'd hook onto the words that were the same and say, I know that, that's neurolinguistic programming. And I'd have to say, no, that I studied neurolinguistic programming in two different locations when it was first launched in California and New York. And then I explained what is what I learned from it and then explained what is different. And so I did go through that, what would you call it? Fire? Crucible. Crucible, the crucible moments and had people ask questions, ask questions, ask questions until all of a sudden I said, we're looking at a framework that's, that's about the brain and it's about how the brain integrates all of these things that that you've learned in the past. I want to help you come up with a primary focus, one way to focus it in. Because when I did research, I would go out in the beginning with people that were learning something new and watch how they interacted with their new clients or prospective clients. And then I also watched people who had gone through eight courses and nine courses and watch them interact with a customer to see how the learnings that they had about how to engage with people were different when somebody knew nothing, tabula rasa, and when somebody knew a lot of things. And the reality is that the people that knew a lot of things stayed in the intellectual zone of connecting with human beings. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Right? And yeah, me for most of my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, and so you know exactly what I'm talking about. We should talk more about that. The ones that came in new and fresh, they'd sit there and they'd say, oh, 
tell me more. Tell me what you're looking for. It sounds like there's something there I need to know more about. They went into curiosity, into discovery, transparent. They were modest. Like you said in the beginning, when you said that I was for somebody that has, you know, what I'm doing, that I still have that modesty. They stayed in that place of super high learning and engaging and connecting and learning about that person. That became my star skills program. I found that staying in that place of naivete with people and being curious about who they are and wanting to stand under their reality, not trying to impose, like when salespeople would go out, it was features and benefits. I worked with professional selling skills, the people that the Xerox program, I learned what I didn't want to do. And I launched consultative selling after that, which became, it took off like crazy. It became the alternative. And it's about about consultative sales. I did. Because I remember in business school learning, they were like, this is consultative sales. Yes, that was me. And then when I talked to other people about it, like the salespeople, the companies were related, they're like, oh yeah, consultative sales. Yeah. Well, what do you know? I made up the name and I started it with clients and major companies. So it got out pretty quickly. And it was that it's all about your client and their world and being oh, able man. to- that the, class? No. I was overwhelmed because that class was one of the biggest changes in business school. I took a lot of classes that were pretty good. And there were a couple of classes that were, I don't know, game changers. I don't want to sound like a cliche. And that sales class was one of them. It changed everything about sales for me. It used to be about, you know, I guess I grew up thinking, you know, used car salesman, the guy selling you the rug at mm-hmm. on vacation. And, you know, they know everything, you know, nothing. And they're trying to trick you or whatever. Right. And this was about empathy and compassion and listening yep. and yep. listening values. And yep. well, I got to shake your hand. <laughs> oh, thank it you. It really made a big difference for me. And it changed what I thought. It was a big piece of changing what I thought business meant that before that, well, there were a lot of other changes too, but that was one of the big ones that was like, it's not just about winning at the other's expense and it's more about creating relationships based on understanding and sharing. And And Josh, that's exactly what you just described is that it's a a new reality. You opened a door and you stepped into a completely new reality. And that's that idea of being able to step into new realities and not being called schizophrenic, but having that be in fact a how just a, a part of what it means to be human and not only be human, but to, to test and move your humanity to higher levels with others, not just be the best speaker on the platform, but to learn how to engage with people in a different way and apply this new wisdom at a deeper level. So it's not just a program. It's an embodiment that you learn. This is who you can be with others. Feeling inspired? Do you like hearing others acting that you're not alone? Go to joshuaspodek.com slash podcast to hear other interviews, but even more valuable, join the growing community of people who care enough to act, not just talk. Read the list of people who have taken on personal challenges and then commit to one yourself. Don't be surprised if you end up loving it, changing more, and finding people following you without you even trying. That's what happens when you improve your life by living by your values. So now I have to ask a very practical question of, okay, Mm -hmm. so if I want to get more of this, Or if a listener wants to, you know, maybe they're looking at a situation and think, okay, people calling me iconoclastic or or something like that. And this is scary, but there's something, I know that there's more to this. So do they email you? Do they go to your webpage? Do they read your books? First of all, they're, yes, yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) If they want to take a look at my recent book, which is the one called Conversational Intelligence, which does synthesize and bring into center a lot of the things that you and I are talking about. It, It concretizes it. It gives people things to experiment with. I have a concept about becoming an experimenter or a mentor of experiments with yourself and with others. That's how you break through. Like people say, how do you change habits? And there's a lot of research out there that says that you need 10,000 times of this and you know X amount of weeks of that. No, you mentor an experiment, you own it, you design it, you, you, you test out something new. And once you realize that you're getting a different result, that's it. That was one experience that changed your life. You don't have to do 10,000 things. That's old thinking. That's trying to retrain your neocortex as opposed to activating your whole brain to see the world from a new perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's telling me that conversational intelligence will give me the ability to see things in new ways and to be less focused on like 10,000 hours or Mm -hmm. change my perspective. Right. It's an active book. It's not like just here's a bunch of facts, but here's things. No, every chapter is here are things to do. Every single chapter tells stories because I love to tell stories about real clients and 
what they learned, what I learned. The first one, I guess my humility will show up in chapter one when I talk about the worst client I ever had and how we fired each other. I think the title is we fired each other. And and that's it. You've got to step out of a, a reality that you hold on to, which could be for a lot of people being the best you could be in what you do. And when you stay in that state of mind, you will fight for what you believe in. You become addicted to being right. You get into tell, sell, yell so that people really listen to you. And those are the behaviors that we say are the behaviors that cause you to fail, not succeed. And I want to provoke people to begin to see around them the patterns of their behavior and other people's behavior that will make the difference in extending their success and happiness and health in their life and in the lives of others. And it comes through looking at conversations in a completely different way. So to answer your question, that book is a great book. I have a trilogy. So Conversational Intelligence is the first book to read, and it's not that long. Creating We is the next book. And The DNA of Leadership, which is a little bit more scholarly, but people that are in the training business that are looking for chunks of knowledge that they can, every chapter has specific chunks of knowledge. There's a pattern that repeats. There's a story, a contemporary story. There's a anthropological story. There's what you downregulate, what you upregulate. There are case studies and things that you experiment with. Lots of great. So I'm an experimental organizational anthropologist. And so I want to give, <laughs> give that to people. <laughs> I love that. So, and you know, I poo-poo books that are too scholarly, but if you've done the work and you, and you have practiced, then the theory starts making sense. So mm-hmm. if, if it's a trilogy in the third one, and by the way, I remember doing a little research and like, I don't think any of your books, it gets as low as four and a half stars in their ratings. And you, so mm-hmm. like, these are all really very highly regarded books. Mm-hmm. And uh, cool. I'm going to jolt the conversation in a separate direction, if that's okay Great. with you. Because, Perfect. Perfect. And I love that. And if people want more, now they know how to get more. So when we scheduled this, and you, were, you know, it's leadership in the environment. And mm-hmm. you were very clear, like, I'm not environment. It's like, that's kind of, I'm not exactly sure what you want to do here, Josh. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to talk about, if it's okay with you, I'm going to switch on to talking about the environment. Yeah, go and for it. My goal in doing leadership in the environment, I want to have people who are either leaders or people expert in the environment or both. And I think you're qualified on the leadership front. Mm-hmm. And I want to have people talk about and experiment, do things actively with respect to the environment, because I think there's a lot of missing leadership in the environment. I think there's a lot of people who are, they want change and they're telling other people to change and they're trying to pass laws to force change, but not necessarily change themselves. And I think people can disagree. I look at the environment. I think there's a lot of places that we're messing things up and we could do better. In my opinion, better meaning less pollution, less global warming, things like that. Do you think about the environment very much? If so, what do you think about when you think about the environment? I'm going to challenge you on that word, environment, because I'm going to tell you what came up for me when you said that. Uh And I didn't expect it. So that's the fun of doing things live with someone, not just planning to do it, but actually doing it. So this conversation is doing something different than I anticipated. In somewhere around 2005, something like that, 2006, I was on a board. I joined the board in 2001 and we had a big fundraiser, which we do every year. And it was part of what people could put money onto was called Building with Books. Building with Books is where you donate $10,000. And we ended up doing with another family to build a school in a different part of the world, Africa, in our case. And by putting that money in and building the school, and I have a picture of the kids standing in front of the school after it was built, it enabled girls and boys both to go to school, where in Africa... In Mali, this particular West Africa, they only had schools. If schools were built, only boys went. And the environment shifted dramatically. So it's a different use of the word environment, but the environment shifted dramatically when we built the school in Mali. And we have a picture of 50% of the kids were girls, 50% were boys. And that meant that girls would be able to, from that school, have a different life trajectory than anything that they would have had before. We changed the environment. So we changed their internal conceptual environment as well as the physical environment. I'm glad that you brought up a more generalized uh, way of looking at environment. And in fact, it was one of the early things that I learned that I took for granted that people saw the environment a certain way that I did. And that really provoked a lot of resistance and was very annoying to people because some people don't agree about global warming and they're very intelligent people. They know what they're doing. They're not idiots. And to take for granted that people see things the way I do 
was, let's say, ineffective, to use a, um, what's that word? Uh, the, is, euphemism. Uh, to use euphemism. euphemism. Yeah. Of like me just being a jerk to them. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't helpful. So what I've tried to do is let the person I'm talking to interpret environment as they want, because global warming is one thing, pollution is another, education is another. And so for what environment means to you, what do you think about? I think about... I mean, I guess maybe you just said it. (laughs) Yeah, I said it with an example. I'm going to give you the science behind it, that there was a time when we believed that you have a set of genes that you're born with. They're called template genes, and they are the template for who you are to become and in the last 10 years, epigenetics has stood on top of genetics and has become a new way of thinking about how we grow and how we change as human beings and what that is all about. And it turns out that epigenetics says that we have different types of genes. One is template that's like you're going to be tall because your parents are tall or heavy because your parents are heavy or whatever it is. There's certain things that you get that are template-like, but there are other things which are the epigenetics or the thing, the genes that change, and they are designed to be impacted by the environment. And when those genes are impacted by the environment, as they were in the case of the school, where as a result of the environment changing, these girls ended up, some of them going on to college, some of them becoming doctors. It's amazing what it does. And what we've learned about how the environment impacts our genes and turns on and off things. And so you have template genes, and then you have these transactional genes that enable you to transact with the environment, to interact with the environment. And that's where language comes in. And that's where culture comes in and all those kinds of things. So for me, that's environment. That's the environment I want to impact. Okay. So I was about to ask, does that mean that a way to change yourself is to change your environment? Completely. Are there things in the environment that you are looking to change for yourself, for others? You know, it's funny. They had a TV show that they took a couple or they took two people that were boyfriend and girlfriend. They switched the place that they were living. Instead of living with each other, they put them into different families to see what would happen. And the new person, and actually, I don't know the the scientists that did this, but they took bees. And this was a way to examine the same thing. They took bees from one hive and they move them into another hive. And they move the bees from a gentle hive where everybody got along, and they move them into a very aggressive hive of bees. And they watched what happened to the bees that went from gentle to aggressive. And what do you think happened to them? I want to guess that the entire yeah. rest of the hive became gentle, but I... It's... Yeah, I know you want to think that, so do I, but forget it. <laughs> um... It's Yeah. And so that's the thing. Like, So my thing is, what are the environments? How do I learn how to read an environment based on the kind of impact that it's going to have on people? So at the moment, certain interactions take place, but they have long-term impact. And that's what I study as part of conversational intelligence. Every conversation has an impact. And once we learn how to code the impact, the push and pull energy that happens during a conversation, you can read, you can map, and you can predict what these people are going to be like when they get older. Fascinating. Yeah. That, that's what I study. That's what I do experiments with. When you said to me, you know, you're going to do an environmental experiment, my brain went, and I like had a split brain reaction. <laughs> one, one was, okay, if it's about the kind of environments that I'm studying and I love to, I'm game. You know, I'll push this envelope further in the world that I'm studying because that's what this year is about. 2018 is all about growth. But if it's about environment, meaning do people pick up trash around the house? Do they stop smoking? Do they you know, eat better food? I, yeah, I could do that, but it, I wouldn't have the same passion. The experiments that I'm doing drive me into such a level of um, endorphins and oxytocin and sharing with all my coaches who are then going out and doing these experiments with me. That's my focus for 2018. And if you talk about playing in the environment in a different way, and I can define what that environment is, I'm game. Okay. Yeah. My goal is to get people who are listening. My goal is not to get people to change their values. It's not to get people to do what I want them to do. It's for people to look at their values. And if they believe it's for people who want to do something, but haven't been able to, and can learn from others doing it, because maybe you'll do something. It's an experiment. You don't know the outcome. Maybe something will be easy. Maybe something will be hard. They're looking at the same, they don't know if it's going to work, if it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And so I'll say to you, like I say it to others, and I think it will mean to you something meaningful, even if it means something different to other people, but I think mm-hmm. it'll still be useful to listeners. And so I'm going to invite you to take on a challenge that is something that is 
consistent with your values uh-huh. that you come up with that it doesn't have to change the world overnight. I don't want people to feel constrained. Like if I don't do everything that I, it's not worth doing anything, but so it's something that you care about, something that you want to do and do it as an experiment, but with the mindset that if you like it, you might keep doing it long term. And that we'll talk again a second time after you've done it to find out what the experience was like. I don't think that what I'm going to choose is going to be completed in a year, but I definitely know that we're going to make extraordinary progress in a year. So and that's something that you're yeah. going to, I have this little constraint that I do ask is it's not something you were already doing in the past. Well, everything that I've been doing in the past is leading to where I am now. So I don't want to redirect myself to another something that doesn't hold the high energy uh, frequency that, that this project is all about. What's new for me is that I almost gave up on the global immersion that I could get the world to think about this. So it's only in the last couple of weeks that I've really been trying to redefine how I approach this lifelong project, if you will, or desire to make something happen. You know, I actually said I'm going to make it bigger rather than downsize or limit myself, I'm going to expand this project and believe that there's a way to get it into every country in the world. That's new. That's, okay. And that's something that you're going to do? Yeah. And that's something that's involving your environment that you're going to actively do. It's different than what some people are doing, but mm-hmm. all of them are different. <laughs> <laughs> they should, yeah, and they should be, which is great. Yesterday, I proposed a way to make this become more real. So this is parallel with with your request for me to find something. I came up with the idea of researching with the 2,500 coaches that we have from 75 countries and trying to map out using a global map where people have, where they live, where they work, and what area that they want to focus on to bring conversational intelligence to their part of the world. So it could be government education, early education, university education, what did I miss? Business, you know, those kinds of things. And even sports. And I want to find a map for the people that work with us. And then from that, begin to build cohorts, ambassadors of each parts of the world and of each subject matter area or focus. That's big. I've never thought that big before. So it's like taking on that, this challenge of where in the environment and how do you want to approach it? This is a new strategy for expanding this work in the world that hopefully has more, you know, the kind of gravis that will make it work. So is there any part of it that we could make into a SMART goal? I mean, we could talk again in a year, but I wonder if there's any sub part of it that would make it possible to talk in a month or two months or three months or something. This map is a SMART goal. To be able to create, to map out, to find a way to map out so that we can be communicating with coaches about progress. First of all, to find out that this is something that's in their heart to do, that they're not being told it's a goal that they have to do. It's because this is something that drew them into this work. So we have people with goals or aspirations is the word that I like to use and that they found each other and they kind of say, oh my God, this is my dream team. And I have people that are going to support me. We now know that when you interact with other people and uh, share with them what's on your mind to create, that it becomes real. It goes from a vision to a reality. And, And so I want to learn all the things that we have to help provoke in others who are committed to bringing conversational intelligence around the world. I want to find out what it takes to give them the right food to take them on this kind of journey. And I've never done that before. It's always just been me trying to get people to even listen or think that this is doable. And for years and years and years, decades being told, uh, it's crazy. You can't do that. I don't understand what you're talking about. I feel Uh, like saying something as crazy as like waving a red flag in front of a bull. You're like, yeah, now I know what to do. Yeah. Well, you just read how I work. <laughs> so is the smart part of the, of the goal is to figure out the map, is to create a map? Yes. Uh-huh. How long would it take to do it? Like, could you figure out when the next conversation would be based on how long you anticipate that would take? Last night at 10 o'clock, I spoke with the person that is helping me with getting the research out to this group. And she said, we, did a, we tested it. We did a first round. And uh, she said, now we have this data. What do we do with it? And so I said, I want to talk with you about it and see if we can start to literally physically lay out a map from the first round of whatever you've uncovered and then see if this idea even makes sense because we've never done anything like this before. And she said, and how soon do you want us to get this map ready? And I said, it needs to be ready for the second program in our certification. The first program starts on Monday. 
this Monday of the 10th. And then two weeks later, we have the second program. So you could, that's our goal date for when we want to be able to share this map with others. Also, well, two weeks from now, that's pretty soon. Three weeks, two yeah. Weeks from now. Mm-hmm. Would you be up for talking again in three weeks or maybe? After, yeah, after I talk to the coaches, because they have to be the first ones to, to see this. Yeah, and then I'd be open to talk again. So can we schedule that now or do I do that through your person? Yeah, M- Molly just got back. You can explain to her what we talked about as after I have the second session. The first session, interestingly enough, is about aspirations and about awareness of how the world really works in, at the level we're talking about, which is this energy level. And then the second session is about scalability. How do we scale things up? And that's the perfect time to share this map with our coaches. Well, what you're doing, the specifics of it are unique, but it's still about scalable you know, we're doing something we've never done before. It's Mm -hmm. impacting other people. And so I think the challenges that you face are going to be very similar to the challenges other people face who might be working on litter or pollution or something like that. Uh And so I think people will still learn. And there's a chance that four weeks from now or whenever it is we talk and you say, things didn't go as planned. We had to do all things different. And like, I think people learn from that as well. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Do I have time for a quick little story? Yeah. Okay. I did work with uh, Dryers and Edie's Grand Ice Cream. And Gary Rogers, the CEO, along with Ray Kronk, they had they acquired a fifty million dollar ice cream company, which they ultimately sold to Nestle's for about three billion. And uh-huh. I was a consultant that spent a lot of time with them. And one of the stories in the DNA book is about what Gary did. And what he did is created a project called You Decide where he said to his people, he'd hang out with them and he'd say, you know, I, I listen very carefully when I join your meetings. I join it at your level. So he undoes his tie. He takes off his coat. He's not the big authority. He's not positional power. He's power with others. And he listens for the strategic direction the teams or conversations are heading in. And then in many cases that he has to be able to support their ideas with money. And, he has, and he'll say, if he feels comfortable, he'll say, you decide, how do you want to do it? And they come back with a proposal and he puts company money in. He gave this particular group, when I was there, a million dollars to run commercials about some of their new uh, lines, the new ice cream lines. And it abysmally failed. And he wasted it. Well, someone could have said he wasted a million dollars, but in his mind, he was building a muscle. And the muscle was that, okay, I gave you a million dollars. We didn't get a, a big return on it. What did we get? And what do you think based on what we're going to talk about that we got and didn't get? And so they came up with a new strategy. And when they did it this time, the money started to roll in and they were $16 million up at the time where he said, let's debrief on what you did because that's life. You know, you climb it, you start to climb and you start to fall and you start to climb and you start to fall. And you could say, oh, I felt twice, I'm not good. Or you could say, oh, what did I learn? And where do we go next? And the you decide strategy is that. And I hold that inside of me a lot when I'm doing projects to take it to the next level. There's, it's experimentation, being an experimenter, taking the learnings, moving it you know, into what you do next. I want that, those kind of strategies. They're conversationally intelligent strategies. And I would love them to be part of how the world works, not the punishing and making you feel bad and saying how stupid you are. There's a video that everybody should watch. It's on YouTube. It's Jacob Barnett. Jacob Barnett was diagnosed at the age of one and a half to be incurably uh, on the spectrum and would have to be institutionalized. He could not function with other people. And you'll see him talking at the age of 11 and sharing what he knows, what he does, and what he believes. And then you will learn now from me that three years later, he was picked by Stephen Hawkins to be his first protege, that he was labeled something that was not who he was because people didn't understand who he was. And this is, again, part of my theory and strategy that we are so much more, to go back to the beginning, as individuals, we all have a unique DNA. It could be very different than other people like mine was and perhaps like yours was. And while you're doing this project, every human being has contributions to make to the world. So people like Jacob Barnett, fortunately, his parents said, I don't believe you, authorities, and I'm going to do it my way. And she and the people that worked with Jacob released in him a genius that they've never seen before since Stephen Hawkins. And he has now reinvented Einstein's theories. He taught PhDs how to become PhDs before he was 14, and so on and so on. So that's what I want to release in the world. 
man, I love that what you, in the context of thinking, well, things might not go as planned, things might not work as, you know, things will have to be redone and so forth. That's your mindset. That mindset is so, it's healthy and it's encouraging and it's invigorating. And it means that like it turns challenges into opportunities and now I sound kind of like cliches, I guess, but it's it releases. It's trying to put into words what the feeling yeah. that you get when you hear that or when, when mm-hmm. you feel that. Yeah, yeah. And imagine that people used to think that at the age of forty you learned what you want, or at the age of twenty you were who you were going to be, or at the age of forty you know you finished being an adult and or whatever, and it was getting soon to retire. And we have more people are living to be a hundred. Centenarians are the largest category of growth in the world people living to beyond 100. And people are running uh, in major races and doing Ironman at the age of 80, 90. And we just don't even know who we could become. But I do know that it's bigger and more than how we envision ourselves. And technology plays a part in it, helps us redesign our brains. There's so much good there that we have to stop saying technology is bad. You know, so that we have, it's like so much is, thank you for seeing that. And thank you for saying that. Well, thank um, you for sharing what you're sharing because I think that anyone listening to this and they're thinking, oh, she's going to be doing something that's different. The difference between what you're doing and or you don't know what all the other people are doing, but people who listen to a lot of these episodes are saying, well, it's not going to be specifically like the environment that we've been talking about before. They're missing of the mindset that goes into it and the practice and the relationships that are all, and how many people are looking at the, say, carbon levels and saying, well, we can't do X because if you don't do Y, it's not big enough. And, you're dealing with the same things and taking them on the same way. And you're also not accepting people saying can't be done or Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter that way, or you should do it this way. All right. Maybe you should do it that way, but I'm going to do it this way. And it's, there's something very, very similar. And from my perspective, and it's not the only way to look at it, but from my perspective, there's a core of leadership, personal leadership as well as leading others that you're exhibiting that it sounds like extremely natural to you. I'm sure learned through discipline and diligence over a long period of time or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, but you're not superhuman. No. You're not doing anything that anyone else couldn't do. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to get across. And now I really want to hear on the other end of it, how it went and how maybe it'll be boring and you'll just get everything done exactly as planned, but maybe it'll be exciting and it'll be who knows what. I know it's going to be exciting. I love it. That's if it just was <laughs> planned, you're like, when I was learning to ski, I had a friend and uh, this is in graduate school because I learned really late. And uh, when someone fell, our word for it was you learned something. And so when we got to the bottom of the hill, if one person came, you know, was later to come down and they were covered with snow because they fell, everyone would go like, oh, what'd you learn? <laughs> and it was really nice. It was like, sometimes I'd say, oh, I'll go a little faster. If I learned something, I learned something. And it, that change is very different than saying, if I fall, I might get hurt. But I didn't think that way. And I yeah. So here's the picture. When I started out my first job out of graduate school, I ended up working at a hospital and I was given six boys aged 13 to 16. And I was told I had to make the curriculum and that I had to streamline them back into public school. That was my goal. And there was no curriculum that existed for this. So I had to build it. And I started to build things where these kids could use, stand up and physically learn together, draw pictures on the wall of what was going on in history, rather than just reading it in a book with letters and words. I taught them art. I taught them music because I wanted to activate the music, the rhythms, the patterns in the brain. And I did all sorts of things that were completely antithetical to what anybody thought. And these boys thrived. And I ended up meeting my husband and getting married and moving to Kansas. So I never spent more than three months with them. At the end of the year, I got a gift from one of them, Michael. And he was in a private school for boys now. He was taken out of the hospital school where people were afraid that these kids were going to commit suicide. They didn't fit in. And he was in a private school and he sent me bookends that were Sisyphus. Sisyphus pushes the rock up the hill. And that became, for me, back then I was only 23, 22, that that became the model, one of the models of what I hold inside from this very wise boy who turned it into a physical image, like God's, who I was connecting to also back, you know, in history, Sisyphus is a God. So those are the kind of things that come into my life to help support me to know that I'm on the right path with this, that I'm meeting and helping release and free people to become geniuses in whatever way they were made to contribute to the world. And it's so satisfying and gratifying. And I guess that's what you're looking for in a way 
is what can someone change in their environment that and study and do differently in order to find that what comes out of it is this release of extraordinary energy in a human yeah. being, right? Yeah. And that's what motivates us. And that's what keeps us from giving in and mm-hmm. feeling demoralized. And, and with that, I've realized that everything you say makes me think and want to say more. And I'm going to have to take the advice of, I don't know if it was P.T. Barnum or someone to say, always leave them wanting more. I don't know who said it. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave myself wanting more and looking forward to the next conversation. I'm going to leave all the listeners wanting more because there's no other way. I, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just want to keep going on. Um, yep. Is there anything to wrap up with before finishing the conversation? No, I guess what is getting me really excited is that you had the openness and the flexibility to enable me to rewrite what environment meant for me. Because I remember in the beginning, I said, I'm not sure. I don't know what I can take you know, on. I don't want to go and start projects where people pick up garbage along the roadside. I know of that. I've done that. You know, I'm, I wanted to learn more and learn something different than I've never done before. The last little thing, I got to work with a disruptive innovation project where I interviewed five parents with kids who were extraordinarily breaking out of the normal paradigm. I interviewed all of them and I had them in front of a big audience so that the audience could learn as well about parenting. And the one thing in common was that every parent observed their child to see what their child was interested in and then gave them more and different and more and different, whether it was magazines around the house or whether it was observing the patterns of what they looked at when they went shopping. They made their observation of their children their goal and then to support their child with more and more of what they were fascinated by. And the world, if we could do that, instead of sending people through school where you just learn what somebody else thought was the greatest thing in the world, but you use that as part of what you you learn, but that doesn't become what you get tested on. It's not being right that you can mimic what the teacher thought was good. You have to help people think. And that's what Jacob Barnett's little video, it's on YouTube. And it's how do we help people think and then discover who they are. So I'm excited about your project. I got more excited after the today when you allowed me to take it where my mind and heart wanted to go. So you're doing a good thing, Joshua. Thank you. I mean, when you said it, I thought, do I think everyone's like me who's listening to this? I doubt it. That's gotten me in trouble before. And so I thought it's, I want to connect with people. I don't want people to be like me. I want to help people Mm -hmm. be the best them that they can and to empower them to do what they think is best. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Maybe some people go in a direction I don't like, but I'll take that if it happens. I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'll talk to you again in about three or four weeks. Okay. Fantastic. I'm very excited. Me too. I'm very excited. Okay. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye. I loved her and my shared approach to active learning and to doing things, not just talking about things. And I loved how friendly she was. I was challenged to accept her perspective on the environment since I didn't see how to measure some of the things that she was talking about. I couldn't see how I could measure the effects on pollution or CO2 levels and things like that. But her results speak for themselves. So I decided to listen and look forward to hearing her results. As usual, I'm kind of curious. Do I look forward more to her having an easy time, in which case it looks easy to change things, or for her having challenges and seeing her go through them and how you have to work through different things? In any case, I'm looking forward to hearing how it goes. Did you feel inspired too? Then act. Go to joshuaspodak.com slash podcast and click to commit to your personal challenge so you can inspire others. Value means better and worse, and living by your values means living better by your values. You may struggle at first, but it's the hero's journey from living by others' values to living by yours. People say that little things add up. I won't argue against it, but what I find counts is acting. Doing something, anything, starts that mindset shift from the debilitating others should act first or making excuses to the empowering I can make a difference and living by my values improves my life. I don't have to wait for others to act first. I'm looking for leaders, people who will bring what works here in this podcast to communities I haven't reached. Billions of people want to change their behavior. There's room for leadership from personal leadership of just yourself to whatever scale you want. Start by acting and changing yourself. Go to joshuaspodak.com slash podcast and commit to your personal challenge.